Hello and welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. And today we have a special nerd guest with us, James Intricasso, over here. And how are you doing today, sir? Part of the game. Oftentimes we break things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the last project to come out that you worked on was Wild Mount. Yes, yeah. So the last project uh, that I worked on for Wizards of the Coast was also my first project with uh, Critical Role, um, which is the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, uh, which uh, was a super duper fun experience. So my end of that was all working with Matt Mercer. Um, and then Matt took the stuff to Wizards of the Coast and worked with it uh, on their end. So uh, that was pretty much for me uh, a critical role project because of the team that I was working with there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's what, how so I... uh, what parts of the book did you work on? So uh, so we all kind of had a hand in everything. So the, the writing team was me and Chris Lockie and Joey Hake and Matt Mercer working together. Uh, Hannah Rose played a big part in editing. She actually uh, edited both on the Critical Role side and then on the WOTC side. WOTC then hired her to be a freelancer to edit there, too. Um, so she's... Uh, that sounds like a... double dipping to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, WOTC can change a lot mechanics-wise or, or cut things out or that kind of thing. So it's good to have an editor on both ends. Um, and, uh, and she was invaluable during the process. Uh, you know, uh, the only person who maybe worked harder on this book than her was Matt himself, who, who was, you know, constantly reading it and checking in. Um, but so my part was, um, uh, I had a handful of spells and monsters and magic items and, uh, some of the, uh, gods that are in there. Some of the lesser idols are something that I helped create. Um, all of the uh, like adventure hooks that are in the gazetteer section are uh, things that I worked on. So those are all, uh, you know, that's the uh, several tens of thousands of words kind of spread throughout there that I worked on, scattershot. And then uh, the big things that I like wrote kind of uh, from the ground up using some of Matt's notes were Isil Cross, which is this big frozen section of islands uh, that's uh, north uh, uh, off the coast of the continent. Um, and then uh, an adventure called Frozen Sick uh, that is actually being given away for free right now on Roll20 and D&D Beyond and Fantasy Grounds. Um, so people can kind of like get a taste of Wild Mount uh, if they want to. So that's a, an adventure that I'm actually running you through right now, Dave. <laughs> that's what I was about to say. That one sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's an adventure that uh, partially takes place in that frozen continent of Isilcross. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was, I mean... It's a huge book. It's a massive, massive tome, and uh, it was really fun to work on with the the whole crew. Um, and uh, it was fun to be able to make some spells and magic items and monsters and things like that because I've written a lot of adventure content for WotC, uh, but not necessarily tons of monsters and magic items. And okay, like so you're dipping your toe into that water now. I mean, not that you haven't done it before for other companies. Totally, uh, totally. <laughs> so, uh, Fire Brat, maybe? I don't know. It's it's letters and numbers. But uh, they want to know, was there any content that didn't make it into the book? Oh, wow. Uh, so much content uh, that didn't make it into the book. I'm not sure what's been said and what I can and, and can't talk about, but... Um, uh, <laughs> don't worry, James. It's just me, you, and a couple people on the internet. <laughs> right, just the internet. Uh, that's forever. Uh, so, but I, I will say, there's like, uh, the book maybe could have been fifty percent the size it was with some of the stuff that just didn't make it for reasons of like needing time to play test, uh, getting to cut the book down, all that kind of stuff. So there's. Um, there's some stuff that just uh, didn't make it in. And I think they even said to Matt uh, when he turned in like the final version with, with stuff cut and everything where it's like, yeah, you can turn in less than this next time. So, uh, cause it is a really big thick book. Um, so there's, there's stuff there uh, that I don't know what will happen with it. Um, you know, uh, technically uh, all of those words 
now belong to Critical Role and to Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so, you know, I can't say whether or not something will be done in the future with it or not or anything like that because that's all up to them. Uh, so. so I don't know if you're allowed to answer this question or not, but were you hired by Wizards of the Coast or Critical Role? That's a great question. Uh, so uh, I was hired by Critical Role on this project. Uh, and the way that came about was um, Matt was looking for help. Uh, he hired James Hake, who had worked with him on the Tal Duray guide for Green Ronin. Um, and then he said, we like the deadline was fast approaching. And he's like, we got to come up with some other people. And uh, he said, Joey, you know, do you work with this other guy that you worked on this Dragon Heist book with? Uh, and he said, yeah. And he said, I, it seems like a nice guy. I've been on his podcast. What do you think? And so Joey, uh, a.k.a. James Hake, who goes by Joey sometimes because his middle name is Josiah, uh, especially, unfortunately for him, whenever he's on a project with me, uh, because I'm also James, he tends to get the nickname. Um, so, uh, but anyway, he recommended me then after having worked with me. Uh, and that's sort of how it all came about. So we worked on it together for a several months and then it went over to wizards of the coast and wizards of the coast looked at it and you know made suggestions and tweaks and uh that kind of thing while working with matt the whole time uh, so how many how many wizards of the coast books has your name appeared in now so counting counting wild mount uh the six published uh seven that have been announced uh, i worked on the uh the theros guide that is coming out as well uh, i had a, a very very tiny chunk of stuff in that uh but that was really fun to work on too um so uh so yeah so seven it's surreal how old were you when you started playing rpgs uh nine <laughs> and at what age did you know you wanted to work on them like nine and a half probably <laughs> right um it's something that i wanted to do for a while but i i didn't really pursue until i was probably about 28 um so uh and and it's one of those like i got into it and i thought it would be cool but i had no idea like how do i get started right i wrote a couple of pitches and sent them to dragon magazine uh you know when i was in college and stuff but um, they never really went anywhere because I didn't know what I was doing or, or anything like that. And most of it came out through the blog, right? I I worked on the blog by myself for a while. And, and then I would say, like, share it on forums and Twitter and stuff like that. And the internet would say, this is good. This is bad. We would like it better if it was like this. And that's kind of how I learned design Ooh, was, that sounds uh, awful via the internet <laughs> it's just yeah. like having a guy stand over you and beat you with a stick as you work <laughs> until you get it right exactly yeah it is a little like that but it's also there's so many good people on the internet you know like there's there were certainly people who were like at, who still now when i put something up on my blog are like this is trash don't listen to this guy everything he makes is overpowered underpowered whatever it is right um uh it's too uh too liberal hippie for me uh you know sorry, sorry too... james i didn't know you back then <laughs> <laughs> exactly right all that kind of stuff um certainly still happens today but there are a lot of people who are willing to say oh hey i really like this and i would like it more if you did this or like oh you know what you you might actually have a thing that if you changed it here would be different um and you know you, you don't have to engage with people that way on the internet that's a lot of time that you're giving up for essentially a stranger right um but uh, enough people did and and i found my community that way and uh and now i try to do it for other people right pay it forward give it back uh, all that kind of stuff so um seems to work for you i mean you're writing a lot of dnd meet content I am. I am. Yeah. And it's, you know, it was, it started out as like a, a fun thing to do this blog and it kind of blossomed from there. Uh, I started to apply for some freelance gigs like into my, uh, I guess into my like second year of blogging. The first thing that I worked on was for James Hake. Uh, so he was the editor of this magazine called Insider, which is through Patreon. Uh, and I pitched him an article, uh, and that was my first paid work was, was for him, right? He was the editor in, of this magazine and I sent him a thing and I got accepted. Wait a minute, like, J oh, uh, James Hake? 
Yeah. What yeah. was he like? Nineteen at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> all right, folks, just bear with me. James is really uh, James Hake is really young. I don't know how old he is now, but I, I feel like when he first did the first Critical Role book, he was like 21 or, or like right out of yeah. college or something. Yeah, so he was an intern. So he was, I think he was still in college. He was an intern at Geek and Sundry. And uh, he wasn't like, I think, right, this is his story to tell. But I think the story goes, he wasn't working directly on Critical Role at the time. And somebody said, hey, you do this D&D thing this guy matt mercer is writing his book and like you know uh is looking for help what do you think and like that's how he and matt mercer got hooked up and and ended up uh working on things but yeah he was i don't know if he was 18 or 19 but he was young and i didn't know at the time right um and i'm glad i didn't know because i don't know that i i like to think that i wouldn't treat him any different he's definitely a peer He's one of the best D and D writers out there right now. He's got amazing ideas, and I was so privileged to work for him and with him so many times. Um, and uh, and he, I, it wasn't until I interviewed him on my podcast, right? I have an interview podcast, kind of like this, um, that he came on and he mentioned something about being in college still, and I was like hang on a second what <laughs> yeah. uh and i was like oh you're a boy genius and amazing and now he's a man genius uh and uh and incredible uh so, as yeah, the legend I, goes exactly so william wants to know would you ever be interested in making your own book you kind of have haven't you yeah i did i made a an adventure path with um a guy named john four called the demon plague it's a level one through 20 D D adventure uh that uh that is available on drive through and on uh through john's website roleplayingtips.com slash demon plague um john kind of uh came to me with a, a concept but then you know we ran with it together um and then i've got other things that i'm working on right now that will uh continue to come out one of the things that i'm really pumped about um that i talk about a lot online is i'm rewriting the monster manual right now with my dad um, in fact, Dave, you met my dad when he came over to, to do it one day. I did. Uh, uh, so uh, Dave, Dave was here hanging out and he met my dad. And my so what I'm doing is I'm showing my dad the art of different creatures from the monster manual. And I'm saying to him, like, what do you, what do you think this creature's name is? What do you think it does? What do you think? Like, how does it act? All that kind of stuff. And then I'm rewriting the monster manual uh, based on what he tells me the art is. Right. Um, and that has been really fun uh, because there's some wild, wildly different things uh, that that he thinks uh, about some of these creatures. Like he thinks beholders are the size of a grapefruit and that they like <laughs> yeah. roll around on the ground. He didn't think they fly. He was like, well, obviously this thing must like pull itself with these tentacles uh, that it has eyes on the end of and it rolls around. Uh, and so like that's a totally different thing than what a beholder actually is. Right. Uh, so it's been fun to uh, to do that. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, so do you have a working title? Uh, yeah, it's My Dad's Monster Manual is what what I'm going to call it. And I guess clearly <laughs> that's going to be a DM's Guild release. Yes, yeah, I think so, just because we're using uh, DM's Guild monsters and, and things like that. So um, that will end up uh, being on there. I'm working on it right now. Uh, Hannah, the aforementioned Hannah Rose, is is going to be editing and uh rich lescaflair who i think is in the chat here he just I appeared i just uh, i just saw him appear yeah yeah he's gonna be helping do layout and and uh, and making it all look good so uh you know without them i am nothing so <laughs> so martin pat wants to know uh what did you think about having the art provided by all the fans of critical role oh i thought that was amazing uh the the art in this book uh, in the wild mount book is really really good um uh, some of i think some of the best art that's been in any D, &D book period editions whatever everything aside um and it kind of creates a very nice uh mix of stuff um like i think there's when you're putting together a book i think there's kind of two ways to go with art styles uh which is one is like you know everything is sort of the same style and and works together and then the other one is like Everything is kind of slightly different, um, but that's okay because it, it works with the world and it works with what you're doing, right? Instead of having like 
three disparate styles or, or two disparate styles. It's like, look at this. Every time you look at a piece of art, you're going to get something different and unexpected. And it's still evocative and uh, and part of what the world is. And Devin Rue, uh, her maps are in this product and her maps are amazing. Um, so not only is sort of your uh, your scenic and creature art amazing, uh, Devin Rue's maps are really, really good. And I heard Chris Perkins talking on the the D D podcast dragon talk and he said that like through this book they have found artists that they will be hiring for other projects which is great that that is really cool mm-hmm. i you know i was talking to uh crystal sully about art and like one of the some of the projects we've got coming up and she she's like yeah i'd love to do a project with with Devin, Devin Rue, I was like, I would love to have you both on that project, but I don't think I have like 40 grand for an art budget <laughs> <laughs> because they are really good. Really, yeah. really good. And I could definitely appreciate like having a bunch of artists to work on something because we decided we wanted to keep with uh, the same art styles in our first project, mm. which sounds great when you're like doing it and then. <laughs> You go to do it and you're like, oh, they're human beings and they only can produce so much art at a time. <laughs> right, right. And let me tell you, the art that is in uh, Out of the Box is uh, knocking it out of the park. That is amazing art. Uh, each one of those looks like a like an incredible painting. Um, yeah, Kim and- Van Doon did an amazing job. Daryl mm-hmm. T. Jones did an awesome job on the cartography. Was, yeah, we were so happy with that. Uh, Taurus wants to know, James, any tips for inspiring writers writing their own adventures? Yeah. So my my biggest advice, right, is get out there and do it. Um, so if you're if you're like thinking about it or on the fence or you haven't put anything out there, I would say do it and uh, and give yourself deadlines um, because you're only responsible for yourself. And I one big thing that is true is that like perfect is the enemy of done, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so one reason I was grateful to have the blog is I knew that I had to put out content every week, right. To, to make the blog sustainable. You understand the same thing with YouTube, right. And yep. with your own blogs and stuff like nerdarchy has to keep putting out content. And so if you kept tweaking everything till it was perfect, you would never put it out because you're never happy with your own work. Right. Um, dude, but- whatever you're going to create, create a hundred terrible things and just put it out there. Yeah. You know, and then you get to, you'll get to the good stuff. You know, some people are just going to be geniuses and you know hit it out the out of the park right from the get go. But you know, most people don't. You have to hone your craft. Yeah, I you know I blogged for two years before uh, I put out anything that was like actually sellable. I think right, and even now I look at that sellable product and I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have put this out, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing is like getting out there and doing it. The other thing I would say about adventure design specifically is like um, when you are crafting your adventure, think about like I find it's best to present situations and not assume how the players and the characters are going to tackle those situations. Right. So you might have uh, like when you have a dungeon, instead of saying when the players do this, this happens. I say, here's what's happening in the dungeon, right? And and I'll say, if the players do X, Y, and Z, you know, like maybe I'll give a, a few like common uh, ways I imagine the players might interact with something. Um, these things happen, but I don't assume that the players have to do X to get to Y, right? And, th- and I think that's the biggest thing is like learning to wrap your mind around adventures that way is is very helpful um because i think sometimes we prepare our home adventures that are just our groups are going to play one way because we more or less know how our home groups are going to tackle something and for an adventure it's better to leave it open because you don't know what they're going to do and kind of the more open you are the better i think that's why we love the dungeon right It's the, you can be very open in a dungeon, but also everything's constrained in the walls of the dungeon. That's why we love Barovia too. (laughs) Barovia is this big sandbox that has the hardest, most defined walls of any place because you go into those mists, you're dead. Um, So yeah, do that. uh, And then play test uh, would be my other big thing, right? Like get out there, play test your stuff. 
um, and, and rewrite it. Uh, you know, if you can work with an editor to get a good set of eyes on it and that sort of thing. Uh, and then once it's out there, uh, don't do what in the television business is referred to a launch and leave strategy, which is like you shout about it the first day it's out and then you like just hope that it'll make sales. Like keep bringing it up, uh, keep talking to people about it, uh, keep sharing the thing that you made uh, and uh, and be proud of the work that you've done. Uh, and I think that's the best way to get it out there. Nobody's gonna be a big bigger cheerleader for your stuff than you. Uh, so if you've got, uh, you know, sort of nerves about that. It goes against everything we know about being humble, right? Um, but but get out there and shout it. Yeah. I don't know. What Squeak, do you think, Dave? Squeaky wheel, man. No, like, you know, one is, like you said, you just, you know, have to do it and get out there and write. Uh, two is, you know, it's never going to be perfect. So, you know, why, you know, why keep beating a dead horse? And you're going to need that feedback anyway to know where you need to improve anyway because, like you said, you can always just tweak and tweak and tweak. Um, you know, self-promotion, be shameless is, is essentially, you know, what you need to do. You know, how can you get other people to care about your stuff if you don't care about it enough to talk about it? Um, and like you talked about writing, you know, more open-endedly and we, like, that's just my style for GMing anyway. I don't, I don't create solutions. I create problems. Right. And then the players, the, the, the player's job to figure out what to do with it. Even sometimes with puzzles and traps and things that you feel like should have a defined way to solve it, I won't because I'll just see what my players come up with. Um, sometimes they'll come up with stuff you've never even imagined and things that you think are simple, they'll never come up with. So it, it's just easier for me to be like, just to wait for me, for them to give me a reasonable explanation or idea and be like, you know what? Yeah, that's how you solve it. And then I think they feel better about it too because they came up with a, a unique solution yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah i think anytime anytime the players have a weird idea uh i like uh i like to see whether it succeeds or fails it's going to be memorable right like if we if we just swing long swords left and right all the time yeah it's not it might be fun right and that's good but it might not be super memorable but if you, uh, you know, throw a keg of uh, ale at a bugbear and it hits him in the face or you drop it on your toe, you remember that, right? <laughs> so I agree. I, I like to say when a player says, I want to do this weird thing, I'm like, all right, let's see what happens. Roll a d20 or give me right. this check or give me that check. Mm -hmm. I, in one of our favorite dice games, someone wanted to do someone wanted to try and buck someone or throw some that one. That was hanging around their waist and they were like hanging from a rope. And the DM is like, well, I've never asked for an athletics check for a pelvic thrust before, but here we go. <laughs> uh, if, and that was a guy slanders from how to be a great GM because he is a great GM. So, yeah, you know what? Just go with it and have fun. That's ultimately what we're here for anyway. Yeah, tell, exactly. Right. Tell it's, weird it's, stories. Yeah, yeah. It's all pretend. And like when I think about uh, we talk a lot about game balance sometimes, you know, and, and balance in adventure design and stuff like that. And I think to what we're really talking about, right, is giving our players a certain kind of experience, right? And that's why some groups don't care about balance because it's like, I, my players don't care. They want to go in there. They want to do weird things. They want to try to succeed against all odds. Uh, and sometimes that's going to mean the game is quote unquote balanced. And sometimes it's not. But when I think about, uh, there's another form of balance in games other than like monsters and enemies versus player characters, right? And that balance is within player characters. Uh, like I don't, I don't want to necessarily play a role-playing game where one player's character is way more powerful than another one. And so you don't, f like that feels worse to me than a battle where like there's, a really big tough monster that you have to fight um and so i i always like ask myself if a player wants to try something crazy i'm down because that's usually not going to upset the internal player balance right i always have more monsters so if they want to try a cockamamie idea and it you know it kills the dragon because they were super clever 
that's super fun and great for me and i have done my job as a dm and i can always have a bigger dragon show up if i need to like we we never run out of monsters right so it's more that question of like if i let a player I, i'm not going to give one player a vorpal sword at level one uh and everybody else gets nothing because then that player feels super awesome right um, and so that's kind of where I, I look at balance. Uh, and, and when I ask myself that question, should I let a player do this or not? Um, that, know, that's, that's funny. Cause I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Some GMs get really precious with their monsters and mm -hmm. I'm just like, so what the players have a cakewalk encounter. feel, they feel really good about themselves, patting out each other on the back, get them next time. You know, I got all, got all these books full of monsters and things floating around in my head. There's no need for any of that so well and we have like undead and like the same way players come back to life your monsters can use the same methods right if you really were are bummed about uh that uh that dragon maybe that dragon has a dragon friend who can cast the resurrection spell like it's like the munchkin <laughs> game you, you know you have the son of or parent of <laughs> like right. you can throw down on the board exactly <laughs> so poison wants to know what does your dad think of the bugbear ah so that's a great question so my dad um he's not like a total uh newcomer when it comes to fantasy so there were some creatures in the book that i didn't uh, i didn't show him or he knew what they were right away um like if i showed him a goblin he would probably say that's a goblin and here's what a goblin does because he's read tolkien and stuff so we've stuck to some of the weirder monsters however i did show him the bugbear which leads me to the other way some monsters have been cut from the book which is my dad perfectly described a shifter from eberron when he looked at a bugbear right so sometimes he's looking at creatures and he describes like another creature that exists in D&D &D lore and I don't like I don't want to remake the shifter just with different art yeah uh, so I I that one has actually gotten thrown to the the side of the road because he said like yeah they're not you know they're not quite like full werewolves but they they look like normal humans most of the time and then when they uh you know they enter like they can enter these little rages that make them stronger and their hair grows longer. And I was like, wow, you're pretty much spot on shiftering right now. So, uh, so will yeah. there ever be, or has there been a blog entry where it's like the stuff that he like kind of nailed as a monster? Oh, you know what? That would actually be a good idea. Uh, the nailed it edition. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there are some like, um, I showed him a, uh, the, the married, right. And uh, which is like the funky fish looking genie in the mm -hmm. monster manual. And he looked at it and said, oh, this is a genie. And I was like, wow, like first thing out of his mouth when he. That's it. weird. How do you even think genie? Because it doesn't look like a genie to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't. So it's got like a swirly kind of yeah. watery bottom. So I don't know if he that reminded him of like the Disney uh, Aladdin genie, you know, or what. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, he, he got that. Spot. He's like, this is clearly the Will Smith monster. <laughs> right right exactly exactly uh so yeah so the you know what is weird though is like my dad sometimes does things too that are really difficult to design um and and that's fun i try not to shy away from those monsters and say this is impossible i what i do instead is like I'm going to give this my all and, and do this. And then I will have myself and some other people play test it and see if this design actually works. And if not, we'll keep trying. Um, yeah. Don't let it, your dad punk you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and that's part of the thing, right? It's like, what cool thing is he going to come up with that? I wouldn't have thought of on my own. Um, so like one creature he said is the size of a mountain. Right. And I was like, Oh, man. we're talking like, thousand foot reach right for this creature and that yeah. kind of thing and uh and so i'm like well will a thousand foot well how much damage does a, a thing with an arm that's a thousand feet long do and uh you know so i don't know like right now i have a creature so it's a cr30 creature right um but it does a hundred damage on a hit because it's the size of a mountain is that too much maybe uh i don't know uh we'll see level 20 character can take at least one 100 hit like that yeah so i don't know uh we'll see <laughs> yeah that's one of my pet peeves about 5e maybe it started happening in 4e when they shrunk the monsters mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, it's really, uh, it's, you know, and I think gargantuan is a size that can be, like, as big as you want. Yes, um, but we used to have colossal mm -hmm. that was the size up from gargantuan. And yeah. that that's basically, that's what I, what I thought of immediately when you mentioned the monster the size of the mountain. Yeah, have you ever seen that uh that that red dragon mini? Right? Yeah, I I had gotten it for Ted for Christmas one year, oh, yeah. and that like that thing is all inspiring when you put it next to a regular mini. I mean, the regular mini fits in its mouth, fits in its claw, like like that thing is amazing to have to put on your table to be like I got to fight what, like that that when you put a mini next to that, that truly gives the feeling of what it should be like to fight a dragon. Yeah, it is so, uh, so intimidating and awesome. We got it for uh, my boss because uh, when I was in college, uh, I was in like res life um, and our boss would run D&D &D games for a few of us and uh, we got it for him. Uh, and it was he I remember he took a picture of his baby next to it because he had just had a baby and the dragon was bigger <laughs> than his baby crazy <laughs> as it should be as it should be exactly exactly i just want to say uh dragon ball talk big ups for donating that plasma today oh nice and Heck yeah we got another question from you from sgm editing how different mm. is writing your own content versus writing content for wizards all right, so I think I know SGM editing. Uh, I think that might be Mr. Sean Merwin uh, uh, talking to us. So, um, uh, who is a great designer and editor, and everybody should uh, check out Sean and uh, and follow him because uh, he's awesome. Uh, so, going for yourself versus someone else, um, I think the biggest difference, right, is that when you're the when you're writing your own thing um i really try to do this when i'm writing my my stuff is like just go wild uh because you can right there's nobody to tell you like well that can't happen in you know like the, you can't use magic in that way in this world uh you can't um create creatures like that because we sort of have this theme or healing doesn't work this way because of that um so i think the biggest thing is like you can you have more freedom, certainly, with your own imagination, but then you also have more freedom with the rules of the game that when you are writing your own thing. Uh, and, uh, like, go nuts and break the rules. Uh, I have an adventure called Invasion from the Planet of Tarasks, and everybody's like, oh, well, why would you fight the Tarask? You could just fly and cast Acid Splash and you'd kite it the whole time and yada yada. So I was like, okay, well, let's... that's." Problem number one is let's tackle this. The first thing that comes to mind when people think about the Tarask now is how easy a monster it is to beat. Uh, and so I was like, well, let's, the Tarask can throw stuff, right? Like it's out there creating big piles of debris. Why wouldn't it just scoop up a handful of rocks and hurl it at you? Uh, and now if that hits you, you get knocked prone. And when most flying creatures get knocked prone, they fall out of the sky. So now it's dangerous to fly around the Tarask, right? Um, so I think uh, thinking about stuff and, and being okay with like breaking the rules, encouraging yourself to break the rules is good when you work for yourself because you can think outside the box. Um, and so like that's my biggest thing is like go nuts, make the thing you always wanted to make. And if a rule doesn't exist or you need to strike out a rule to make it happen, put that in your thing, put that in your book, right? You can do that. It's amazing. Um, the advantages of working with somebody else are that uh, all of the work is not on you, right? When you're writing your own thing, it's up to you to get it made. You have to get the art for it. You might have to put up some of your own money for it uh, or run a Kickstarter or uh, do really well in pre-sales, whatever it is. Um, you assume that risk. Somebody else assumes that risk. And the fun thing about working uh, with someone else on their product is they bring their ideas and then you get to build on them and that collaboration is huge uh, I, I love uh being able to take something and say oh cool could we do this and they're like yes and what if we also did this right it's the old yes and uh applied to building ideas uh and and brainstorming and that kind of thing. so 
So uh, that's sort of, for me, the, the biggest difference. I, I think it's maybe it's a little obvious, but uh, I would just push hard into those two things. Like when you have the comfort and safety of somebody catching you if you fall, uh, the other one, you should be taking huge, huge swings because you can. So there's a lot of cool people in the chat. I'm surprised to see. Uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging out with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, put put question in front of it. It makes it so much easier for us to pick them out. Uh, next level 88. James, how was it to go out to the left coast and work on MCDM books? Oh, yeah. So MCDM is Matt Colville's uh, production company. Uh, that was awesome. So that was a week of me and uh, Matt was there, of course, and then Sam Mannell and uh, Mackenzie de Armas uh, were all sort of there working on Kingdoms and Warfare, which is his book that is going to expand fifth edition rules uh, for creating and running a kingdom and then like having mass combat. Um, and we were there working on a lot of the kingdom stuff. You can actually, Matt. Uh, Matt does not keep a lot of the design process secret. Uh, I think that's one reason people really love his YouTube videos. He talks about it a lot, has talked about how things have changed and evolved. And um, the first playtest packet, I think, actually just went out or is about to go out for that. Um, so that was really, really fun uh, because the way Matt ran it was like it was a four hour meeting, go to lunch, come back, have another four hour meeting. Uh, and the whole time it was us like with a whiteboard sitting in that room, kicking around ideas. What about this? What about this? What about this? Um, you know, like challenging each other and uh, and coming up with great stuff about like, what do we think should be in this book? What do we want people to be able to do with it? Um, it was it was really, really, really very fun. Uh, and uh, and we had a, uh, a blast uh, uh, putting it together. And then at night. He had kind of all this team building stuff. Uh, we played games and uh, we had like a movie night and we met the rest of the MCDM team and trust like falls. That. Yeah, no trust falls, no <laughs> trust falls. A lot of uh, code names uh, and uh, and trash talking. So, yeah, code names is a lot of fun. Is that actual trash talking or is that a game? Oh, no, no, actual trash talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I hope you went out and re represented the East Coast. I did. I did. You know, because uh, so Sam is from New Zealand uh -huh. and Mackenzie actually lives in that area, uh, the, the sort of Orange County, L.A. area. Um, and so uh, <laughs> so I did have to rep the East Coast hard. In fact, there was one night that they got pizza from a place and the pizza was good. Uh, and uh, and there was another guy there who said, Hey, this pizza is pretty good. Where's it from? Uh, and they said like, oh, it's from this place. Like the guys are transplants from the, the New York Philly area. And this guy was also a transplant who was there, who like was one of Matt's friends. Mm -hmm. And he and I connected and we were like, oh, yeah, we talk about New Jersey and Philly and Cherry Hill and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Was it a hoagie or a sub, though? Oh, it's a hoagie. It's a hoagie for sure. Get out of here with that sub garbage. All right? <laughs> I'm sorry. This video is about to get downvoted uh, yeah, yeah. because of my opinions. <laughs> yeah. If you ever want to trigger James, just just tell him sub. <laughs> uh, get out of here, submarine. Uh, it, you know, it's it's easily an hour's worth of entertainment <laughs> if you bring that up. Uh, Cabo wants to know how do you start writing? I struggle with the starting part. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing is to do it, right? And so uh, I I have trouble getting started writing because I am like, I want the perfect thing, right? I want, a, I want that perfect first sentence. I want the perfect sort of thing to go. And uh, I think what you should know is you're going to go back and change it. You're going to go back and maybe change every word in a project sometimes. Um, and so it's more important to get something on the page than to get the perfect thing on the page. Uh, I Somebody described it once as like, you're picking up all of the sand in your first draft to build your sandcastle, right? So you're just making that big pile of words and then you're sort of sculpting it and crafting it to uh, make the sandcastle. And the more you write, the better you will become at like making the sandcastle as you go along in your first draft, right? But you'll still have to go back and revise and rewrite and all that kind of stuff. Um, so getting it on the page is really important. And then giving yourself a deadline. Uh, a deadline 
if you can give yourself a deadline that makes you accountable to other people, like a blog, right? Like if you have a blog that you say, this will be updated every Thursday or every other Thursday or the first Thursday of every month, whatever deadline you pick for yourself, um, you will have people as you start to build an audience who will hold you accountable for that. And you'll feel more accountable then because it's like, oh, I got to like it's important to my readers that I also get this up and that kind of thing, right? Even if that reader is one person in the beginning, you'll feel more accountable than to just yourself. Um, so that's my my big thing is like accountability and getting it down, knowing that it doesn't need to be. Do you start with like, uh, do you do like a timeline or outline or you're like, uh, you, like you, you're going to write a new project. I mean, I feel like as gamers, mm -hmm. we always have ideas but how do you how do you decide which idea you're going to pick out of all of them to write about? Um, I mean, obviously, when you're doing freelance work, it's easier because they're like, hey, we need you to do this. But if right. it's your own thing, where do you start? Yeah, that's a great question. I have a zillion ideas. I have so many ideas that I know I will never get to them all either before I uh, expire. <laughs> right. I am dead or there is suddenly a new edition of D&D, &D, right? And that's just for d and I have a million ideas for other role-playing games, too. I want to do a Knights Black Agents hack. I have my own role-playing game that's coming out, like all this stuff, right? Um, so I know that I'll never get to them all. But what I do is I keep a running document. Uh, it's really easy to do, right? We've all got a, a phone now. So like on Dropbox or Google Drive or wherever, keep a running document that you can add to even when you're just like... Uh, chilling on the the couch watching some tv you get a good idea boom you can just pop it in there um so keep that but then the other thing that i do is i will uh think about what i am most excited to do knowing that i'm gonna work on it for a long time right so like i picked my dad's monster manual because i'm excited to do something with my father uh, and i was like this is going to be really fun and i know that this will take a while and I'll have to, at the expense of not doing everything else on this list, this is the thing I'm picking because I want to work with my dad. I think it'll be really fun to do. Um, in this case, I also threw it out on Twitter and said, do people want to see this? And got a lot of big thumbs ups. Uh, and so like that's, uh, that's different ways, taking public opinion, but picking the thing on your list that excites you the most to work on is good. Knowing that like, it's not just the thing that excites you today. It's the thing that after you write it down on your list, you keep thinking about and you keep being excited about. Those are the projects that uh, I tend to go for. Uh, and then I do. I do outline. Um, I usually uh, you'll see a lot of RPG books have like their own design. Uh, so like to go back to D&D, &D, right? They've got a big chapter header. Then they've got big bold headers that are in big text. Then they have underlined secondary headers. Then they have uh, like smaller headers under that. And then under those, they have the bold and italic uh, inline uh, subheads. Um, and that's how I outline. It's like I think about like, how am I going to break this down? What what will my first header be? <laughs> what will come under that? Do, do, do. And then I, uh, I know a lot of writers like to skip around, do whatever works for you. But I like to write like basically from start to finish on a project. Um, so, you know, I like to start with the intro and end with the last appendix. Uh, that's how I that's how I roll. So uh, Dark Web wants to know, do you think they will update 3.5 monster manuals? Uh, I would say word for word, no, but they're slowly integrating all those monsters into the new products. James might have more insight than I do, but <laughs> but I definitely seen, you know, throughout the different books, they, they are doing that. But I, th I think the days of monster manual one through five are dead. Yeah, I think, I mean, right, like, you could call Volo's my Guide to Monsters Monster Manual 2 in some respects, I guess. But, like, they've got all this awesome story info and dungeon layers and stuff at the beginning, right? So it's not exactly a carbon copy of that model. Uh, and then we have Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. So, like, we have, uh, we're getting more monster books, and a lot of the monsters that are in those books are in there, or they're in an adventure, right? Like, uh, the adventures each have monster appendices that add some new ones. So, I think we'll get a lot of people's favorite critters, um, but probably like you said, in, in different books than... Uh, yeah, the format... I see, I see that they have essentially four formats now, right? They have the adventure... Mm -hmm. They have they now you we might as well just say they have the Magic the Gathering, 
you know, crossover the, the now. Campaign setting, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have straight up player books like Sword Coast Adventures Guide mm-hmm. and Xanthar's Guide to Everything. And then the monster books are kind of a mix. They're not just DM content anymore. The right. uh, the strictly DM content, in my opinion, is now just the adventures that they're mm-hmm. putting out. But like Xanathar's Guide, or not Xanathar's, but uh, Volu's Guide to Monsters and Wunderkind's Tomb of Foes, they have all this lure stuff in there that might appeal to anybody, as well as, you know, they try and sneak in races and stuff like that for yeah. players and then monsters. So. I mean, obviously, it's a business, so they're trying to maximize their sales. So I think spreading that stuff out just makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's more fun to read, right? Uh, Like, I I love cracking open the beginning of Volos and and Mordenkainen's because it's like you've you've got uh you've got like some story there right and then if i'm like oh i'm you know like i'm i'm getting slogged down on story i can flip over to the player options and be like oh yeah now i want to create a fear bowl right and then i'm like oh now i want to kill my players so i can flip over to the monster stat blocks and and go there so i, I like that too that variety yeah I, I completely agree what did you call that 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 thing that used to be a giant that's now fey the thing that used to be a giant that's now a fae. Uh, oh, the Fomorian? Is that what you're talking you, about? You said Fearbolg. I always called it a Furbolg. Oh, although... oh, the, oh, the Fearbolg. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, uh, I don't know. I mispronounce I everything, though. Yeah. I'll have to I check bet. with D&D Beyond and see what yeah, they call it. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll bet like somebody <laughs> is uh, is pronouncing that on D&D Beyond somewhere. Yeah. Uh, don't worry. It's probably me mispronouncing it because I mispronounce everything. Yeah, but I I like Fearbolg, but Fearbolg really fits more with the I think the for, the the former version of of the of the creature than the current because the current is kind of like happy and nice, where mm-hmm. uh, fur, uh, Furbolgs or Fearbolgs whatever you want to call them in AD and D I think they appeared in the second Monster Manual, right? And they were just like these giant woodsmanly giants. Like the the, the one uh, I think it was one on the cover, uh, swinging a swinging its axe at a fighter or something. <laughs> and they were bigger, right? Like they were. Yeah, uh, they were giants. They were full yeah. on giants. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting to see them sort of in this new form. It's fun to see, like, you know, uh, where are the areas where it's okay to change a little bit, right? Um, and I, I, that, that seems to be one of them. And I think players are always happy to get more options, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, Hey, we shrunk this thing down, but now you can play it right. Like that, that becomes a thing that, uh, pleases people. You know, there's, uh, like even the latest edition of Eberron, there are some cool little tweaks. Uh, They added the, uh, enormous Warforged Colossi and, and things like that. So there's always fun things to see whenever a new book, uh, comes out. The uh, 5e has been done a really good job of adding story to a lot of the creatures that were kind of like the crazy wizard did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, like they weren't going to figure out where, where that monster came from, like a carrion crawler or an owlbear or, or some, or uh, what is it, the Perton or Periton? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, where they've gone and added a lot of more lure elements to these kind of creatures where, you know, the, during the Gary Gax, Gagax days, they would literally just find a toy and be like, yeah, that'd make a great monster. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, like our most iconic D&D monsters literally came out of like some pack of toys from Japan or someplace. Right, right. Yeah. And, it, you know, it is interesting to think about, like, where do we come up with monster ideas and stuff like that? Like I, uh, I worked on the Tome of Beasts 2. Uh, for Cobalt Press that just kickstarted, and I pitched a lot of monsters to Wolfgang um, and uh, Wolfgang Bauer, who's the the Cobalt in chief over at Cobalt Press, and that was really fun to uh, to to do and like th- dream up monsters, right? And some of them were inspired by things that I had seen or that kind of thing, and some of them I backwards engineered from like I want a monster that can do this. Right. Like this is the mechanical thing I wanted to be able to do. Now, how do I get there? Right. Like, yeah. what, what does that? How do I make it a, a thing that does that? That's scary and yada, yada. So and sometimes it was like, oh, this contract says I need another aberration. 
uh, what's a good aberration you can think of, right? And it's, just, you know, especially like certain monster types like that are weird, really weird where they're kind of a catch-all. Like, what, yeah. where's the cutoff between aberration and monstrosity? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. You know, and those lines can be grayed for sure, uh, especially between things like aberration and monstrosity because it's like well monstrosity is kind of like a catch-all term yeah. almost and aberration is like a weird monstrosity but all monstrosities are weird so yeah yeah so we are we are we're basically up on the hour a little past the hour um and we have a bunch of questions left but we're not going to get to them unfortunately but we'll be back tomorrow with a new guest we'll have rich leslie flair on which i'm yes. probably butchering the hell out of his name i'm sorry my tongue just doesn't cooperate people even if i know how to say a word getting it from my brain out my mouth it just does gets lost someplace but it's been fun having you on and uh you know we'll have to do it again uh, mm -hmm. in the near future hopefully and you know for a while we have we're all dealing with the apocalypse and the pandemic we figured you know an hour, 45 minutes to an hour a day we're going to come on here and hang out with people and hopefully help you pass the time a little bit thank you james and until next time everyone stay nerdy yeah stay nerdy thank you dave <laughs>